Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Market. This is our daily show from Monday to Friday at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 12 p.m. GMT, every day of the week, where we discuss all things to do with the modern market. That is the crypto market, the market and how to make money on the internet. I'm your host, b -check. I'm joined by my legendary co-host, legendary and we are live on X, we are live on YouTube, and we're going to get into everything that's been happening in our favorite NFT market over the last 48 hours over the weekend. But just before we do that, as always, please do remember, nothing that we say here is financial advice. This modern market is what we would describe as exceptionally risky. So please do proceed with caution and exercise your own judgment. With that out of the way, Legendary, how are you doing this Monday, the 8th of January? I'm GM, GM. I had a fantastic, very, very relaxing weekend, still enjoying um, the holiday before I'm going to be back on, on Thursday. And I'm feeling good. And it seems like we have, um, we have something special about our timing. Last week, we had the big oh. crash on the show. This week, we have the big candle on the show. Um, Bitcoin is pumping and has been pumping in a very, very significant candle over the last 10 to 15 minutes, approaching 45K. So I thought you were going to say 10 to 15 at... seconds. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's still a very good timing, though. It's like, you know, it used to intro music to gently warm up to a pump. So we're like at 44.95K, <laughs> uh, and maybe we could hit 45K again throughout the show. Or you're going to keep wow. the show going until we hit 45K. That's the other option. An endless live stream until Bitcoin breaks 45k. Um, wow, interesting. Okay, I didn't know that was happening. Once again, uh, it's good to it's good for you to be paying attention. That's uh, one of the useful things of having a useful co-host because I'm paying attention in the morning. Then I'm not really paying attention now, to be honest. Uh, so you're you're on top of things. That's good news. So we're happy now. Uh, were we were we happy before? You didn't sound happy. Before, you sounded very contemplative. Sound happy now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, we were in a bit of a contemplative mood before we started the show today. What was all the condition about, legendary? About not worrying that much. It's something that I've been thinking a lot on the holiday. There's like so many things that I worry about constantly that you know don't have a massive impact on my life, but it's still like pick them out and, and choose them to give them a significant um, significant amount of importance, which they simply do not hold over my life. And I'm kind of trying to to change that and to not worry about those things any longer. Yeah, they really resonate. I don't know how we both came out of the weekend feeling very similar. I, in the same vein, had kind of woken up today. I went back to my usual routine. For the people who don't know what my usual routine is like i tend to wake up pretty early i'll go to the gym i'll eat then i'll like get into the snapshot basically straight away but for some reason last week or the maybe the last seven to 14 to 10 days i decided screw everything like forget the routine i'm gonna do something completely new i'm just gonna work all the time <laughs> and i'm gonna fit in the gym whenever is appropriate i don't know if it's actually gonna happen but i'm just gonna work all the time instead how about that as a routine and basically, it was going really bad. <laughs> is my is my conclusion. Uh, it was a terrible way to try to approach everything. So I've just gone back to the previous one, and I feel way better. And in a similar vein to what Legendary just said, like stuff, you know, there's only so much you can do. And if you were to tell us, if you were to have told me and Legendary either together or individually, twelve months ago or nine months ago, that we would be in the position that we were now. I almost wouldn't believe you, at least in certain aspects of it. Like I always believed in the media. I think we were going to move up in that respect. But in terms of like some of the new stuff, like some of these uh, the small angel investing, small other investments, like the way we've built out certain things um, and maybe some other announcements that we have coming up, like I, d I don't know if I would have, I would have thought that that would have been possible just yet. So there's on so many different levels, I think people are doing way better. And I'm not talking just about us here. I'm hoping this resonates with some of the people who are listening in because I can see so many prominent people who have been absolutely crushing it this year in various ways, whether that's on spaces or written content or just even trading and uh, being quality participants in the market. 
And it's like, you're doing way better sometimes than, than you afford yourself the time to appreciate, I think. Um, that was my kind of reflection. Any further reflections, Legendary? Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point. Like there's so many good things to look back to and so many good things to uh, look forward to. There's just not worth picking out like the things we could have done better or like the small things that we still can worry about. And by the way, Bitcoin is at 45K, so it's not going to be an endless <laughs> short, quick segment on that. Um, so it's, it's, it's just such a good environment to focus on the positives and not on the negatives. It's funny that we get all Zen and like peaceful because Bitcoin is <laughs> just conveniently Bitcoin is ripping. So we're all like, oh yeah, the world's fine. Everything's fine with the world. Nothing to worry about. Bitcoin's ripping. Why don't we all just have a lovely, peaceful day? Uh, I don't know if that would be the case. Otherwise, I uh, want to throw to Funky. Kusho has his hand raised as well. Just maybe some quick reflections before we get into the show, Funky. Funky, you're on mute. Yeah, no, you, I, every time I'm, I, was post, I was posting a picture in the replies of a very zen Pepe in the sun. <laughs> and you always call on me right when I can't like unmute the mic. Got it. I was just going to say, shut it down because we already had 45K, but Legendary already stole my thunder. So, uh, but yeah, let's keep going. This is, <laughs> and I loved all the stuff that you said about the Zen thing and not caring too much. Our co-founders just impressed this upon me a couple weeks ago at dinner. They said, you're already doing so much. Don't mm. beat yourself up when you think you're not doing enough. So that's great advice. Yeah. So long as you're actually doing stuff, right? Like if you're not doing stuff and then you're like, oh, I'm super Zen. I like, it doesn't matter what happens. Everything will happen. I just don't need to do anything, then maybe not. But so long as you're doing stuff, you're probably going to be okay. Appreciate that, Funky. Kusho, uh, quick reflection before we get into it. Yeah, Jim. Um, I wanted to hop on based on the thing that you said about us think, doing better than we think we are. Because I was working for a brand and I really thought I was doing a shitty job. Like, I really thought I was doing a terrible job. <laughs> but like, I was writing, I was writing, I'm writing to put together a thread of like, my thought process and how like the entire job went and how it's you know how we put together the entire branding strategy everything and looking at the third i'm like wait i did all this <laughs> and i'm like yeah i mean it's surprising when i'm looking at it as a thread but without the thread i'm just like totally lost mm. yeah i know what you mean man i know what you mean like sometimes it takes you to like actually reflect and write it all down of what you've done or alternatively like someone with fresh eyes coming to the situation and they tell you like oh it, it looks like this is all the stuff that you've done and only then do you realize like oh okay sounds pretty good sound like sounds like i'm doing not too bad at all so nice little way to start the show thinking that we're actually uh not doing a terrible job i don't know if that's the more, the positive zen way to phrase it we're certainly not doing a terrible job some would say it's a a good job as well um but we want to get into the market as always that's what you're here for so let's do it uh as always the headlines and price action that i give to you is coming from the snapshot which is pinned up top if you do find that it brings you some value today please do give it a like so let's get into it starting with the price action we have crypto, and this is obviously not the right prices. Uh, Bitcoin was at 43.7K, obviously pumping to 45. Let's, let me try and get the live stuff actually, instead of reading you this old price action. Uh, Bitcoin is at 45K, up 2.5%. ETH is up a percent and a, a, percent and a half at 2.26. Uh, Solana is actually not down anymore. It's up at 94 so but it was down quite a bit so that's pretty good um in terms of the headlines we have crypto alts selling off as the bitcoin etf confirmation is around the corner want to just reflect on that in a, in a moment legendary legendary to see what the implications are for the alt whether they're recovering or not in just a second so we'll talk about that uh number two azuki rips to 7.3 eth over the weekend i think it went higher it's actually retraced a little bit as the anime token is suggested for the ecosystem and next, Bitcoin art golden ratio moves 4x from a 0 0.04 Bitcoin floor to a 0.15 BTC floor over the weekend. Um, really interesting stuff going on with ordinals. I feel like you know we're just catching up with what's going on there. Big price movements. Want to get into that in a little bit too. Getting into the floor prices of 
the NFTs. We've got CryptoPunks at 56, Board Apes at 25.4, Mutants at 4.9, D Gods down 8% at 3.2, Captains flat at 4.1, Azuki's at 7.4, Penguins at 10.9, Moonbirds at 1.3, and Nouns down 14% at 7.5. Nouns have been slipping down for a little while now. Uh, that's it. That's it for the price action. Those are the headlines. Legendary, any numbers sticking out to you? Uh, just off the bat before we get into the kind of alt situation and the crypto uh, situation i mean obviously the the azuki pump over the weekend plus the last week um is something we spoke a bit about we spoke about you know the upcoming anniversary which already did pump the price a bit now we have more news on that so that is probably the number that stands out most to me but again it's a dedicated piece of news which we will get into a bit later in the show i assume mm. absolutely yeah we're going to talk about that uh in just a moment um okay let's get into them let's get into let's get straight into maybe the first headline but just before we do that i just want to throw to swizzy he's got their hand raised uh swizzy welcome to the show it's been a while since we've had you on actually i think you spoke with us the other day uh what's up gm gm everyone happy to be here <clears throat> i'm jumping in and hopefully not going off script uh, what you have planned um because i have to leave at uh, like 30 minutes um so i have to be quick but i just wanted to add a little bit of context to the third um line so the gold ratio golden ratio because it's a fun story i think and mm. uh, not everything is confirmed but um, i think it was even tyler let's say somehow calling it because uh, kevin Wu did a tweet uh, the other day it was um, saturday night i think and for the americans it was still friday evening he asked for the fidenza of ordinals and then tyler jumped in with the golden ratio the price was still at 0.015, so wow. much lower than you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And it did actually do a 10x. Um, so I think uh, Tyler called it. Then everybody was jumping in. I think even Kevin himself swept some. Um, so uh, this is the action there as well. Interesting. Thank you so much for that context. I was aware that it was a little bit lower just before. Um, so yeah, it has done an even bigger bigger move and when that move is in bitcoin it just feels even bigger right when when it's a 10x in bitcoin it's kind of different to a 10x um or it feels like it's different to a 10x in in other in other currencies um a quick point on that what was i going to say um yeah i think i think the ordinal stuff it's it's pretty it feels like i'm reporting more and more on it like you'll see that in the snapshot there's two notable sales today. And look, there's all kinds of high sales. It's a little bit hit and miss and how I decide what goes in there. Like it's just something that's caught my eye. Um, and at the moment, there just seems to be a lot of Bitcoin sales in, a lot of ordinal sales going in. And again, it's a little bit arbitrary. I'm not specifically looking out for ordinals. I'm not specifically looking out for anything really. It's just something that caught, catches my eye. And to be honest, sometimes I just don't want to put CryptoPunks in there every single day because everyone knows that CryptoPunks, what kind of price they trade at. So I try to pick a different notable sale if possible. Um, and yeah, it just seems to be the case that there's more and more ordinal. So that's just something to note. I always think that when I'm doing my research and um, kind of staying on top of all this stuff on a daily basis, that gives a good indicator of where the market is going. And I'm just noticing a lot more of that in the last few weeks weeks what do you think about what's your thought on that kind of the that bitcoin ordinal move and just the other reflection on on the ordinals yeah i you're very right on that like we've been talking more and more about ordinals there's been more significant moves i think also that a part of the reason is that not only um is this like the second cycle of ordinals if you want to call it like that and we just have more infrastructure than we had um early that at the start of last year in february um of last year but i think additionally that with so much of the news being centered around the btc etf it feels like stuff that's now going on on bitcoin gets an additional exposure mm -hmm. even if it's ordinals with the um, etf topic in in the background yeah i like that way of thinking about it it kind of makes logical sense right that attention is on on bitcoin and as a consequence um 
the NFT ecosystem underneath it is going to get some more attention at the same time. Uh, I think that does make sense. Um, yeah, I agree. We also have a bit of um, a bit of news regarding the um, BTC ETF that John posted in the comments. It's actually a post by um, Eric Volkunas, the Bloomberg analyst. Bloomberg question mark Vicek. Yes. Yes. Um, so basically, we now know a bit about the fee situation um, from the S1 filings. And we can see that the BlackRock um, Bitcoin ETF will be priced at 30 base points, which is 0.3%, um, with the addition that the fee actually will be 0.2% for the first six months or um, until $5 billion are reached, then 0.3%. Um, we see Venek in at 0.25%, and we see Fidelity at 0.39%. And um, the sentiment from Eric Bokunas is that he seems to be very surprised how low um, those fees went and basically the, the fee price war that um, we see happening on, on the ETF. So he didn't expect BlackRock to come in at 0.3%. It's much cheaper than he predicted it to be. Interesting. So what? Hello? Uh, my, my internet is breaking up a little bit. Yeah, you've been cutting out for me a bit. Okay. Did you hear my question? No. I said, when we're talking about this 0.3%, uh, what exactly is that 0.3%? It's um, the the annual fee of the ETF. Got it. Okay. Um, interesting. Do we have any perception as to what a, a typical fee might be or anything in that region? Uh, it really depends on the type of, of ETF, uh, how, how high the TR come out. If you look like something like a very big um, Vanguard FTSE or MSCI World, then you might see 0.2%, you might see 015 and you see fees ranging all the way up to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1 point something percent. Everything above that, I would say, is rather expensive, very expensive for an ETF. Interesting. Okay. So we're saying this is like a, a very competitive, competitively priced ETF would be the main yeah. conclusion. Yeah. So I think if the fees would have been like a half a percent to 60 base points, um, nobody would have been really surprised. And the surprise rather is that all those institutional um, funds slash investors expect there to be um, so much demand that they want to go into a price war and that even BlackRock does this little discount model of going down to 0.20 to be cheaper than um, Venek until the first 5 billion in the ETF are reached or the first um, six months have passed. Okay, that's super interesting. I think that's a nice, you kind of touched on there being potentially so much demand. And I think it might be useful to go into this tweet I found from OSF over the weekend, trying to predict like what might be what, what's the price action for Bitcoin and maybe other assets over the next couple of weeks, taking into account some of that potential demand. I don't know if you saw the news. I think this came out in a spaces on Friday, potentially, where someone revealed this. Uh, they, he says, there are rumors that BlackRock has $2 billion in the wings. It's not clear to me what that $2 billion is or means and if it directly translates to volume. But if it does, it obviously gives their ETFs a strong chance of breaking the day one volume record. Again, these are just rumors at this point. Um, he also interestingly provided this the top 25 most successful ETF launches on day one. Uh, so there's all kinds of things on there. I don't know if you can see that easily, Legendary, uh, on the screen where well, I need to try to zoom in more. Yeah, I can see it seems to be a lot of MSCI world action in the sustainability and, and climate section, hmm. as well as, yeah, a lot of sustainability focused things in the top four, top three. Yeah, interesting. But so I guess that's one of the key questions people are asking in like, to what extent do you think 
is one of the the best indicators of its success like that first couple of days of volume like is volume the thing that people are looking towards it seems to be one of the things that osf is looking at i've seen other people kind of suggest the same thing and that's why this two billion figure which is only rumored at the moment seems to be significant but is that what people are really looking for do you think yeah absolutely i mean when we had the the bitcoin spot etf in europe the criticism was meh nobody was really interested in that rather lukewarm demand two two things that are the best um advertisement for the um, spot etfs for blackrock for vanek and all the others is a the price of bitcoin and number go up and b just the inflow into the etf and i would assume that blackrock vanek have a high interest obviously to make that successful in in both those dimensions because if price goes up they make more on their fee mm. that's quite quite straightforward and if they manage to say um that this is one of the most successful if not even the most successful etf launch we have seen in the history of etfs that would be an amazing piece of advertising for the bitcoin etf as well what do you think of this question from sunny delights on youtube he asked etf is the etf finally going to happen i mean i think the next point is maybe a bit more nuanced because blackrock to a big extent controls the financial economy owns a lot of the stock on the s p 500 to an extent i feel they have influence over the sec isn't there some statistic where they've basically of 96 is it is it 95 applications i don't know if it's specifically for etfs or 95 applications of something to the sec they've had almost all of them approved is that correct they have a they had a vast majority approved um i don't know the the exact answer to that um obviously blackrock is a massively massively influential company with their um nine trillion us dollars or 9.4 trillion um, dollars on the management with a massive ownership in all the s p 500 companies like apple and all the others they have a significant stock of them them as well and it would be um delusional to not think that they have that it would be delusional to not admit that they have a lot of influence in in so many institutions um but even you know yes they might have some influence over or in the sec but even with all that influence they have filed the etf approval has been postponed so it's not like a blackrock can you know walk to the sec and say approve this shit tomorrow but i i kind of like that in our kind of see that in our space we have a lot of blackrock conspiracy theories <laughs> like when we had that disaster show last week with the flash crash the first thing was oh blackrock that i read on the timeline is you know is is dumping btc so they get a cheaper entrance Yes, BlackRock has a lot of influence, but BlackRock is not the answer to every financial move that we're seeing in, in this world. And they are definitely not behind everything that's going on. Yeah, completely fair enough. Uh, Matthew in the comments provided the information that we were looking for. Shout out to him. He said only one BlackRock, BlackRock ETF has not been approved uh, ever. And I'm pretty sure that's out of mm -hmm. 90 something. I've just double checked. To see if it now I'd be there. curious to know which ETF they didn't get approved. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, we we need to find out. Uh, Want to throw to picks on this topic? Uh, welcome, picks. What is your thought here? GM, GM. Uh, yeah, one of the things that you said is we need kind of the volume to go up. You know, when ETF is approved, and I feel like the funds that are trying to get the ETFs approved, they know this. So most of them created this structure where if you're in the first 1 billion, 5 billion to invest, you get this kind of discount on the annual fee. And when you invest like a lot of money, it's, it's like also a lot of money, right? And I know that most of the ETFs and specifically I know about, uh, I think, Invesco, they will do like no fee and no annual fee for the first like half a year mm. on the first 5 billion assets. And I'm pretty sure like, most of the ETFs are going to do similar thing, which will make most people who want to invest in Bitcoin invest really fast to kind of fill those quotas. Because like, if you're not in the first 5 million assets, I mean, like, I understand it's a lot, but if you have like a trillion under management, you know, 5 billion is not like a lot. So <laughs> you would definitely fill this quota quite fast. So we will see definitely a, a spike in volume just because of those 
that's just my initial thought. Yeah, very, very, very fair enough. Legendary, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it goes exactly with, with what we said, and Pix is completely right with the competitive nature that we're seeing in this market, which to me only can be a result of the high demand that everyone seems to be um, anticipating. Okay. I think we've spoken about this a lot over the last few days. I think it's obviously very relevant because we're moving into quite an exciting period of time for Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know if any, anyone else saw this, but on the All In podcast over the weekend, uh, you know, obviously very successful investors, when asked what was the, you know, I can't remember which category it was, they were kind of doing 2024 predictions and they were they were saying is was it going to be like 2024's biggest winner or best tech or something it was like one of the positive ones and chamath uh, said that this is like the year for bitcoin basically it's like it's it's a very going to be a very very important year for it uh, to try to see like you know is it going to i don't think he was even asking the question it was kind of suggesting that this is bitcoin's year um so that was interesting to note um but i think we've spoken about that enough for now just a final point on it from the comments as well this is john providing shout out to john sims eth for providing this quality information um there's actually been a little bit of a fee war even immediately so they said arc dropped their fee to 0.25 percent in an s1 file 20 minutes after blackrocks but then there's some other information which suggests that the blackrock fee will actually be 0.2 percent uh, for the first six months uh, then 0.3 after so yeah, I guess they're, they're trying to compete. Sounds like a very competitive market to be operating in at the moment. Uh, I wanted to expand this conversation a bit broader to the rest of the alt market because that's what seemed to have got hit hardest in the last 24 hours before this move up. So even when I was reporting on the news this morning, Bitcoin was like was pretty strong. It was it was steady. ETH was down a bit. Solana was down m much more. Um, I just want to see now, Legendary, what the impact has been on alts we obviously know bitcoin is up eth is up solana is just a touchdown but recovered from its kind of its its dip it's at 93 now not completely recovered but recovering what do you think the position is for alts moving forward like going into this week that's super important for bitcoin itself this is like the key thing people want to in terms of rotations for the people who do trade more I'm not one of these people that's trying to catch every move and be circulating the funds, but how do you think it, it could play out at the moment? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. I mean, personal answer would be that I did shift funds into BTC from ETH and other, um, other alts over the weekend, kind of wanting to participate into the, mm -hmm. the approval action. Um, we also see a lot of people on the timeline posting, you know, that Solana dip is a good opportunity to buy. I think nobody's worried about it from a like fundamental perspective that something's wrong with Solana, say, or any of those other other blockchains. Everyone kind of knows that people are shifting their capital into into BTC in anticipation of the ETF approval. So um, whoever wants to have more exposure to Solana or any of the other altcoins or alternative L1s or whatever kind of coins they are. Um, are very happy to to buy that dip. And I think this is exactly what we kind of have seen uh, playing out. The, the question is going to be how that will evolve if um, we see the approval and we see a massive, massive demand and price in, in the price mm. of Bitcoin. So if like Bitcoin hits 50K over the next couple of weeks or, or something to that extent, that would be more interesting to see how that would impact the alt market in a post etf world interesting interesting stuff I, I like the way you've been you are thinking about that just a quick point from both jabs and matthew in the comments jabran the lawyer and matthew uh the investment is it advocate i'm trying to see investment advisor uh I, I was completely wrong with my number. They have indeed only had one application that was denied, but it's out of 576. <laughs> so 575 ETFs have been approved. One has been not. So there's even greater chance of approval than we were even uh, suggesting. So thank you for that, Jabs and Matthew. Um, one of the ways I wanted to analyze this legendary is 
we've spoken a lot about like a probabilistic way of thinking. I've spoken about it in terms of assessing angel investments and thinking like, okay, well, what's the likelihood when you uh, see things market cap uh, or a, a raises market cap and the FDV, what's the likelihood of it going up? What's the likelihood of it saying same? What's the likelihood of it going down? And what's the likelihood of the project rugging? Like th those are the four things that I, the four probabilities that I kind of found out that you try to assign a proportion to each one and then you can determine your investment. And I guess maybe like, would it be completely wild to do something similar for, for this situation? Like say you held a lot of, let's see, I don't know, injective optimism, any of the things that have been running recently, uh, injective tier optimist, like all the L2 tokens have been running as well. Arbitrum optimism. Um, would it be wild to say like, okay, well, if Bitcoin sees super high volume, then this is my thesis. If Bitcoin sees like good volume, but not crazy high, what would happen if it sees lukewarm volume or if it has bad volume? Like those could be the four types of categories that you, you could think about things, right? Yeah, I mean, I would probably replace the category that uh, arbitrum or optimism rug with a category like of a massive security failure mm. that could lead to like fear in a specific L2. I'm not saying that this is happening in arbitrum or optimism, but this is probably like the security risk category would be the one to replace the rug category for me because I just can't imagine arbitrum rugging or um, optimism rugging. Mm -hmm. But I would say that a probabilistic model like that makes a lot of sense. And it's definitely a good good guideline to have. And it's easy if you think like that, right? Because if you think in probabilistic ways, all you do is compute an EV um, for all, all those actions and outcomes. And you just, you just go by that and it makes your decision making easier and more rational. Yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. As we said, uh, it's touched on the ETF stuff quite a lot, seems to be moving in a very positive direction. That's what all the noise is coming out. And then we've kind of just discussed, you know, some of the implications for the rest of the market. And it does feel like Legendary just suggested almost from personal experience. And maybe that's a lot of the thought process that other people have been thinking as well. Maybe the rest of the market is bleeding a touch to move into uh, Bitcoin. We can't know that for sure, obviously, but um it could that seems like it could be one of the things that's happening uh to try to participate in this quite historically significant moment for bitcoin so definitely we'll be reporting on it the rest of the week as things play out excited to do that let's move on though for now and get into the second headline of the day which is the anime token azuki rips to 7.3 eth as the anime token is suggested for the ecosystem. Now, I want to be careful with this one because I know everyone has kind of jumped to the conclusion that it's definitely Azuki. I've seen something, I can't remember if it's on the YouTube comments or whether it's in the other comments to suggest maybe it isn't. Um, so just for clarity, like this is what we know so far. There is a Web3, let's find it. There's an account called Weeb3 Foundation. Obviously, Web3 Foundation was taken. So we've got Weeb3 Foundation. And the Weeb3 Foundation uh, tweeted, when was this? This was on January the 6th. So I think that's Friday. They tweeted towards an open anime universe. And that was basically it. Uh, they said they're powered by anime. The art style, I'm just going to show this on YouTube for the people tuning in. Um, the art style is kind of a Zuki style. So you can see where that link has been made and there's a deep red as well in the background, I guess makes people think it's a Zuki too. Um, so I, I haven't actually, but you know, on, on those words and on those facts, they're not following anyone. So it's not like they're following a Zuki. So to be a guarantee, legendary, am I wrong being skeptical here? Or is it, has this been confirmed? Do you know if it's been confirmed that it is definitively Azuki? I mean, uh, we don't 
at least to my knowledge, have the definitive confirmation. But what we've seen is a repost by Azuki, a repost by Gangster All Stars, as well as San Fran Tokyo. We've seen Azuki hinting um, an anime experience. We've seen the Wave 3 Foundation also using similar wordings, talking about the open anime universe. Um, if if you want to speculate on the color, because you mentioned using this uh, a, a same deep red, it's actually the very same hex code. It is exactly the same color. Um, so <laughs> it's that, funny. That that's our post. level of analysis. <laughs> that, yeah, that's the level of analysis we go. It's into got the same color colors. in the banner. So um, I I think that. Um, Kim Nguyen had an interesting post saying, they were saying that their speculation is the Weep 3 Foundation is an anime studio run by Azuki and they could produce an Azuki anime, integrate other NFT IPs into the Azuki universe, use the token for payments and engagement. Holders could use it to engage, vote, create their own anime using their own IPs as well. And um, uh, Nguyen's hopium was in 2024, every anime project will be quote unquote backed by Azuki. So um, kind of similar to how in the gaming world we have the backed by Animoca, which makes everyone <laughs> cheer and excited. Yeah. That would be the the same kind of, of hopium for um, the anime token if it were to be linked to um, the Azuki ecosystem in an official capacity. Very, very interesting. That is super interesting. I like this Animoca thought. So I want to hold that thought for a second in terms of trying to analyze the bigger vision there. Uh, a couple of points for clarification from both the Twitter comments as well as the YouTube. CryptoMoka says it's San Fran Tokyo behind it. They have Weebox and launch now Weeb3 with hinting anime. Uh, it was it was indeed retweeted by Azuki. So I, I, I think it's reasonable to say that that's they are you know, in chat or steering this. And Zeit provided some helpful context, said Weeb is an anime Eastern culture term. It's not that Web3 was taken. Legendary, did you know that? I know you're kind of more into that gaming uh, anime side, probably more than me. Did you know that? Yep. Familiar, familiar with the term, yeah. Interesting. It's basically someone who's like obsessed with um, Japanese culture in particular, ah. um, who you'd call a Weeb. Fascinating. Okay, interesting. Um, so that's pretty cool. So what do we think of the actual implications of all that then? We obviously had to do a little bit of investigative stuff to confirm that this is what we think it is. Um, I know that grail.eth, who is a very big holder of Azuki's and part of the Spirit DAO, which is the biggest or the holder of the most premium Azuki assets, um, said said this they've been quiet they've been silent but they've been cooking hard 2024 is the year of anime 2024 is the year of izuki let's see what they can do to bring web3 to anime and beyond um pretty exciting stuff do you think this is like what do you think about the idea in principle what you what you suggested about the comparison with animoka is kind of cool where Everything's every game in the space seems to be backed by Animoca right now, and it definitely gives people a huge uh, push in terms of their marketing and in terms of their ability to attract new users. I think, and it certainly gives the market a bit more confidence in basically any project that's backed by them. Um, do you see that as a reasonable or foreseeable vision for Azuki, where they could become this kind of powerhouse for anime? Yeah, why not? Like why why not using using their top of mind dominance in the anime space to build um, an open IP network that's bigger than quote unquote just Azuki elementals and beans. Yeah, interesting stuff. And then and the collapse between anime IPs is something that we've seen very very often in in the real world something that if done well is often well received by fans so why not see the same um play out in 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 the web3 world i think adding to the token perspective um since azuki is based in in la right it's based on the west coast i think it is la um probably they would want to have a company that does the token that might be outside of the us 
mm. having a different setup for that even would make sense too. So, and on top of that, we have the movement in price, which we've also seen before the pudgy news mm. that we spoke about extensively. And I feel like the movement in price is significant or has been significant. So I would say that there might be enough grounds to speculate on that something is happening in the um, Azuki ecosystem that could be very significant. Yeah, very important. I want to talk a little bit more tokenomics, tokens for these various projects, the outlook for tokens, uh, because we're seeing a lot of them wanting to come to market in 2024, obviously predicting a bit of a better market. So I want to dwell on that a little bit more in just a second. But I want to throw to Kusho first, who I know is also a big fan of this type of art style and culture. So Kusho, uh, what do you? What did you want to come in with here? Yeah, so I wanted to... So basically, the way I think about it is Azuki has a unique position in the market as kind of like the leading anime art project of all projects across ETH, Solana, any other ecosystem, right? So they do have an advantage. They do have a unique competitive edge. And they also have more or less the largest community, meaning that they spread into Asia. They also have Azuki's who are down there in Southeast Asia, in the places where anime is like core culture. But one thing about it is like the anime industry is a very mammoth industry. You know, there is production of anime, there's production of manga, um, there's creation of manga, there's the production, um, there's the actual animation, and there's a lot of things that go into becoming a project that kind of backs anime-led IP. I see them partnering with anime IP, that works, but to see them in a place where they kind of become animoca in a sense is going to be a bit complicated because many of these studios are gigantic studios. They are very huge mm. monolithic organizations and that do not have much incentive to lean into Web3. Sure. Because, for example, when I think of anime studios in Japan and think of like Funimation and some other studios, they make a good number of a good amount of money from streaming their anime and their other things. They have brand partnerships, they have um like real life activations and events that involve the anime IP and stuff like that. So they already have a lot of money. Um the help that I see Web3 bringing into the anime industry is like letting that money flow down to the actual animators because they are the ones that do not have the right condition they do not get a lot enough out of these animes and the money that's made from these animes so unless they try to find a way or a competitive edge in that direction to where they can um, appeal to the anime producers themselves like the draw the artists um the animators themselves it's going to be very tough because, like I said, these are large, large billion dollar um, companies and I don't see an incentive for them to lean into Web3 too much. Yeah, that's that's a very, very good comment. And I think also to add a bit more additional context, because you mentioned the anime market outside of Web3, um, the global market size in 2022 for animes was 25.8 billion. It is a very rapidly growing industry with a CAGR, a compound annual growth rate of 9.4%, which would put the market size by um, 2020, uh, by 2032 at 63 um, billion US dollars. And the largest market for anime is still North America. Interesting. Uh, as you say, a very well-established space and one where there's already a lot of incumbents. I have, I have one of my main thoughts, Pix, I see you with the hand raised, want to come to you in just like one second. But one of my, my main thoughts, when people always say like, what's, what's the incentive to move to Web3? Everyone seems to question, what's the incentive? Like, why would these companies who already make money move to Web3 or, or not even just move there, just like try to participate, try to collaborate, try to take a step in? Um, and one of the things I always seem to conclude, and I thought this with, for example, the, what's the name of the F1 team? What's the name of the F1 team, Legendary, that collaborated? Williams Racing. Yeah, that's the one. Wh Williams Racing with Rug Radio slash with Thread Guy. And I was trying to think, like, what, what's going on there? Like, what's, 
What's the dynamics happening? And I guess people want to just reach people. And one thing that I believe is true of the Web3 community is that we are definitely, well, almost certainly online more than other people. And we exist in this universe more. And this is the place where you can leverage your information much more than other places. So you can just feel that that you can get tangible feedback immediately or almost immediately on how far your content is going. And say if you are Williams Racing, sure, you can do all your traditional sponsors. You can do all your traditional like traditional media, run the ads in the, you know, in the places that you want to run them. But to get more live feedback on that, you need to be like on the internet. And especially if you have a particular demographic that you want to try to get to, and this is the other big sell for Web3, I think, is that for whatever reason, you, you can, you've got great, great information on the purchasing power of people because everyone displays the NFTs that they hold and they talk about them all the time. So not only do you have a group of viral people, and I don't, you know, not everyone is viral, but in the sense that everyone who is willing to interact with you and display their feelings and thoughts about something, so you get that good attention and interaction, but you also got this, this section of people that seem to be quite wealthy. Uh, if you were to generally compare against, you know, a different subsection of the population. So that's one of the key, key things that I think well, you know, would an anime brand that's already established need to move across to Web3? Well, not necessarily because they've got their big, they've got their kind of, they've got their established market, but would they be interested in getting the attention of some very, um, very wealthy, successful pe people who are interested in anime? Why not? A great connection could be made there. Uh, that's one of the things I would think. Legendary, any reflections on that? Then want to throw it straight over to Pix. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's it's a wonderful point that you're raising. And I think also if you look at a metric that I like to watch, which is just look at our audience and look at the amount of blue check marks and compare that to any other industry that's not Web3. Like I would estimate we have like 40% to 50% blue check marks. And then I remember when the first payouts came out and you had this um, Spanish football or, or soccer, um, however you want to call it, fan site on x that reached 200 300 million impressions wow. um and got on, on on a monthly basis and got smaller payouts than um, most of the web3 influencers with 20 30 40k followers just because no one in their audience has um, a blue check mark which is still that criterion that x likes to look at when mm. doing the payouts to so just that very simple thing that this community is willing to have 40 50 percent of the people again judging by our audience right now who are paying i don't know how much you're paying for um the 20. subscription 20 or x plus a bit more expensive right um bucks a month just to use social media which was and still is free to use for all other social media tools and nobody could have imagined to do that tells you a lot about the spending behavior in in web3 and it's definitely um an enticing market to be in on top of the live feedback that you're getting that you already mentioned and on top of actually having a very passionate community if you do things right yeah absolutely and i think well one quick reflection is that we obviously appreciate all of our listeners whether, whether like on a human level like on a personal level we appreciate all our listeners whether they're verified or not however i think one of the things for people to be thinking about um and i guess jack butcher in his art is kind of exploring this right like in what direction are we going when it comes to that verification? I think that there will be, there could potentially be more barriers being built up. Whether you agree with it or not, that's not really, really the point. Whether you think it should be more egalitarian and everyone should be, or whether you think that there should be a subset exclusive for paid people, something is going on in that direction. And it's important to be alive to it and it's important for us to discuss it. So I hope that's a thoughtful way to, to kind of introduce that idea and just Bring it across uh, people's table. Uh, Pix, your hand was raised. I want to throw to you right now. What's your thought uh, on either the anime stuff, the Azuki connection, or maybe this broader conversation about being verified versus not and that attention that uh, we get here in Web3? 
Yeah, so I have some stuff about the anime because I have a friend who works in MAPPA, which is like one of the biggest Japanese anime production studios. And I talked to him back in, I don't remember, I think 2021 or something like this, maybe a year later or sooner. But we talked to him and he was telling me how much it actually costs to, to produce one like season of anime, which is like, mm. I don't know, like 12 series, maybe 13 series. And he told me it was roughly like 2 million or so. So we just have to keep this in mind when we see Azuki producing it as well. And since he works like in a huge studio, right? So most of the costs are already, you know, cut in, in many places. So it could be even more. So, I mean, like I understand that Elementals Mint kind of set them off for uh, a, a huge amount of seasons, but still we have to keep this in mind. And But like there is also a positive side of it as well. Um, I don't know about the overall market, but I know in Japan, uh, shit, I don't remember the exact numbers, but back at the time in 2021, um, overall revenue from all those animes that they produced in Japan specifically was around 9 billion uh, US dollars. Mm. And as to more NFT part, like 4.5 billion dollars revenue was specifically from merchandise and collectibles. So like half of the revenue from anime series is coming from merchandise. And again, this is just numbers for Japan. Sure. So like worldwide, it's going to be much bigger. So yeah. Sure. Amazing numbers. Thanks so much for sharing that, uh, Pix. I've definitely read that merchandise, collectibles is even the most profitable aspect of uh, traditional media businesses like Disney and all that stuff. Like the production of the content is just like phase one, really what you really need to do is get people so hooked on the media and create that connection with the audience so that they're going to go and buy that stuff in the shops. Uh, that I think that's true, not just in Japan, but across the board. So thank you for that. Important to bear in mind. What I want to do now before we close out the show, because I've just got a few minutes left, I'm going to bring you the rest of the Web3 news from around the space uh, to get you up to speed what else has been happening in the last 48 hours in the space. Then I want to throw it to Funky, who wanted to probably make a concluding point on what we've been talking about. As always, uh, this information comes from the snapshot, which is pinned up top. If you find that it brings some value, give it a like. Let's look at it then. Um, we have the Web3 Roundup. Number one, Pixels Online launches a play to airdrop campaign and daily user spikes to 150,000. Uh, There's gonna be an airdrop, and it's, again, <laughs> we're talking about being backed by Anamoka. This is one which has been heavily kind of integrated into the Mockaverse uh, ecosystem. Uh, people are saying it's going to be quite good. Worth having a look if you're interested in gaming. Uh, number two, Manta Layer 2 announces deposits will end on January the 16th. So that's for that particular airdrop on Manta. Number three, Polygon NFT volume surges past $10 million after Gas Hero game launch. Uh, this has been pretty uh, popular, and that I think takes the second highest volume. Next, have Mango Farm chained wallets after the Antonio Brown uh, endorsement. He's an NFL football player. That wasn't very good. Over there. And uh, moving into the more new section, we've got Bold Leonidas creating custom PFPs for prominent creators. He's been doing awesome work over and over again. Uh, next, A16Z writes to the UK government saying no to government protected cartels. They're saying that AI. Uh, we should let the companies just compete. We should not be regulating too quickly to create these government protected cartels. And finally, it's the final day today to submit for more than $4 million of art contest on optimism. If you are an artist looking to explore and try to get paid and maybe win this competition, can't think of a better place to do that in the next 24 hours. Um, that is the rest of the Web3 Roundup. That's getting you up to speed what else has been happening Remember, we do this show every single day, 7 a.m. Eastern Time, 12 p.m. GMT, every day of the week. We bring you all the news from the previous 24 hours that's happening in the NFT market, the crypto market. We're live on X. We're live on YouTube. We're about to close out for today because we run just for an hour. But Funky, you wanted to make a concluding point on one of the things we were just talking about, probably the anime stuff. Not the anime, just the real quick thing on the check mark. Elon sure. has already specifically said that I think they're going to institute like a dollar level where people have to pay to kind of eliminate bots as a proof of humanity. Mm. Um, so that's forthcoming. But I also just wanted to sort of uh, reiterate your message because I thought that was really nice what you said. And for everybody who's listening, 
Uh, thank you so much for being here and being part of the modern market in this conversation. This is a wonderful show that I and many people have come to love. If you're not already uh, following the new modern market handle, please do so. Please also subscribe to the YouTube. That channel is growing like gangbusters, and you get to see their handsome faces. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, you get the best of both worlds. Have a great day, gang. Love it. Thanks very much, Funky. Legendary, any final thoughts before we close out? Well, as Funky would say, Funky took my thunder. Nothing to add to those beautiful closing words. <laughs> Everyone, just do what Funky said. Have a funky day. And I'm going to play a funky tune for the end of the show. Take care. Have a wonderful day. We will see you back tomorrow. Bye-bye.